So I produced this slideshow, the top 50 mushrooms in Western North Carolina, um, a few years ago, um, as a kind of introduction to the mushrooms that you're most likely to see if you go out into the woods. Now, there might be a slight difference between, you know, where we are at 2,000 feet in Asheville. What are you here? What's your elevation? 15. 1,200, yeah, but I'll, um, basically the mushrooms are much the same. Um, I, I did have real difficulty getting down to 50, so it's 51, but who's counting? <laughs> okay, is that forwards? Yes. Uh, so these are the ones that are really frequent in our area. I have taken pains to include the best edibles and also the most uh, poisonous uh, ones with an emphasis on the ones that look alike to the edibles. Um, and there are examples from the most important families or genera of, of mushrooms. I don't include any hard to identify little brown mushrooms, common though they may be. Um, and, um, you know, if you learn to be a successful mushroom hunter, you can start from here identifying other, other species. But if you can do, the, if you can do a, a, a you know, good proportion of the top 50, you're on your way. Um, and just to let you know, you don't need to take notes because I have a CD uh, which the Mushroom Club sells, only $5, and it's got all the mushrooms on it, slightly different order than in this slideshow. You know, each one has a page. It's a page per mushroom, as it were. Um, and at the end, uh, you can, it's a list that you can just print out. Uh, carry with you. Some people I've known have downloaded the, um, um, the PDF file. It's just a big PDF file on the, on the uh, disk. They've downloaded it onto their smartphones and taken it into the field with them. Um, so we're going to have a little introduction to each of the 50 mushrooms. Um, I didn't bring the handout. It's on the... <laughs> it's on there. Um, sorry. Uh, but... Here, everybody wants to know, you know, they say, is it edible? Is it edible? I say, no, 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 that's not the right question. The first question is, what is it? Once you know what it is, you can go to a field guide and check out whether it's edible or not. If, if, if you can't find that it's edible, then you regard it as inedible or poisonous. Um, so you really need a field guide. Uh, two or three are better. I brought some with me. What did I do with them? It was a kind of box. Uh, uh, with a lid. I don't know what I did with it. Um, perhaps, it's, perhaps it's still in the car. Oh, there it is. Yes, there's some books in there if you want to look at them afterwards. Um, and what you want to do is check all the characteristics of the mushroom in the field guide. You've got the Audubon guide. Excellent. Um, and also, you know, if you're just a beginner, get confirmation from an expert before you eat anything. And, and even then, just eat a little um, the first time because people, uh, mushrooms are not the most digestible of foods. They're, they're, uh, cell walls are made of, not of cellulose, but chitin. Um, um, and first of all, you have to cook them. You always cook mushrooms. Actually, you should always cook even store-bought mushrooms. Um, and eat a little the first time because some people have, a few people have allergies, a few more people just find them indigestible and have, you know, mild gastric upsets. Um, and if you're in any doubt about whether a mushroom is edible or not, just throw it away. You know, I mean, uh, learning an edible mushroom gives you a good meal. Learning a poisonous one can save your life. Or, or as we say, uh, oops, there are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, <laughs> but there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. Um, and so let's get going. And uh, here's the one that you absolutely, absolutely don't want to eat. And it is really common in our woods. It is this pure white amanita. Uh, called the Destroying Angel. Um, and I want to draw attention to the features of an amanita. They come up with, all amanitas start with what's called a universal veil um, that starts out all joined up. Can you see? 
You can see how it's broken, and most of on this mushroom, most of it stayed at the base, like this, this sack-like thing called a vulva. You can see it down there. Uh, in others, more of it remains on the top. That's just dirt, by the way. Those black, those black specks are just dirt. Um, but all amanitas have some evidence of that universal veil. And pretty much, there are no absolute rules in mushroom the fungi. There are always exceptions. But pretty much, only the amanitas have a universal veil. And all the amanitas have a universal veil. Although sometimes the remnants of it are a little subtle. And you have to know what you're looking for. So here's the destroying angel. It doesn't have any, any bits of the veil on the top of the cap, but it does have this baggy vulva at the bottom. It also has a little ring that hangs down here. Most, but not all, amanitas have a ring like this, which originally covered up, when it was in this size, uh, covered up the gills, sort of protecting the gills. And then as the mushroom expanded, of course, it broke. And the remnants got left attached to the stem, mostly. So that is um, Amanita bisperigera. You'll also call, find it called Amanita verosa, Amanita verna. Um, it's the destroying angel. And like a, you eat that, one of them, two of them, and you are headed for death or a liver transplant. That bad. And it's a pretty nasty ride on the way, too. Um, now, we have many other amanitas in our area, and some of them are reportedly edible. Me, I don't mess with the amanitas. I do not eat any amanitas. Not worth it. So here's a pretty one. This is called yellow patches. Isn't it lovely? The, the universal veil has ended up in little yellowish warts with much less of it, just a sort of collar down there. Beautiful mushroom, very common. Um, here's another one. Um, this is called Amanita fulva, or I think it's now going to be Amanita amerifulva. The names are constantly changing. I, sorry about that. It's the people who do the DNA studies. Turns out, you know, we got them and we got. We thought we had the European species over here. We don't. It's a different one. So hence, Amanita fulva becomes Amanita. Amerifulva. Um, also very common. Here again, the, all the, all the um, universal veil has, has remained in this baggy, rather membranous cup at the bottom, nothing on the, on the pretty chestnut brown cap. Uh, and and white, under, white underneath. Pretty much all amanitas have uh, white gills. They certainly have white spores. Um, and, and for those of you, you know, if I can too technical, the, the whole purpose of a mushroom, a mushroom is the fruiting body of a fungus. The fungus is underground. Um, uh, the mushroom is just up for days, mostly. Um, and it, its sole purpose is to form spores and distribute them. And in the case of most of the gilled mushrooms, with the familiar, you know, toadstool cap, stem, gills. Um, the, the gills form a wonderful big surface area, because you've got both sides of every gill, um, on which spores can form, ripen, drop down. They're held well clear of the ground by the nice long stalk. And the slightest breeze wafts them away. So they're very widespread mushroom spores. I've just breathed in a whole lot of mushroom spores. They're very small. Um, uh, so here's a couple more. Uh, this guy's called the blusher. Um, that's, a, that's a young one, but it opens up. Again, here, the, the, almost everything, almost all the universal veil, which was sort of friable, ended up on the cap. Pretty much nothing on the, on the stem. But it, you see the reddish stains here? Whenever it's touched, or if just a little insect damage will do it, it gets these reddish stains. So that's a very recognizable mushroom in the field. <laughs> Um, and here's a big, dramatic mushroom called um, Cocos amanita, which can get pretty much mm, getting on for dinner plate size. Um, so that uh, there are several, there are several like this that are very big. Some of them are smelly. Um, old old hambone, uh, dirty sneakers, 
chloriny smell. Uh, cocos doesn't actually smell of anything much. Um, and actually, the absence of a smell is, what, is what one of the things you can <laughs> identify it with. Um, but all of these, you know, enjoy them, photograph them. They're beautiful, but don't eat them. Um, now, here's a group that has some good edibles, the Lactarius or milk caps. And the feature of these is that when you um, cut them, they exude a milky latex, um, very recognizable. They also all have a somewhat brittle texture. Um, here's an inedible one called Pex Lactarius. Um, notice the, uh, it's a lovely orangey color with darker concentric bands on the cap. You don't see them too well in that photograph, but you can see they're there. Um, and it's sort of, I don't know what you call it, sort of cinnamon-colored gills, in this case, very, cro very close, very crowded gills. And you can see the plentiful milk that it produces. Um, I don't know that it's poisonous, but if you taste the milk, you will want to spit it out after two or three <laughs> seconds. Um, it is extremely acrid. It will, it will almost sort of feel your tongue is burning. Uh, very common. See it on almost every walk. Whoa, wait a minute. Okay. Um, here's a one that, that is a bit of a look-alike, except that the, um, uh, the coloration is different. The cap's very similar color, but it doesn't have the gills are a more creamy color, uh, stem about the same color as the cap. Um, and notice how voluminous the milk. Lactarius volemus means voluminous, lots of milk. That is the apricot cap. Very good edible. Well worth learning. Um, and here is, isn't this gorgeous? It's not as common as the other two, but I just love to find it. This is the indigo milky. Um, uh, it, it, the, the, the top is this sort of silvery uh, gray with blue concentric rings. And look at the underneath. I mean, it really is as bright as that. And the milk, the milk is blue too, rather scanty, but it's blue. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous mushroom. Um, edible, most people don't care for the texture. It's a little kind of uh, crumbly, granular texture, but it, it, it's okay. But I usually just leave it be because it's too, it's too pretty to pick. Um, Russulas are in the same group as, as, as milk caps. They lack the, uh, the milk. But they have the same um, slightly crispy, crumbly texture. You, the, 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 there's a well-known test for mushrooms throw them against a tree, and if they kind of crumble into lots and lots of pieces, you've got a Russula or a Lactarius. And then if it doesn't milk, it's a Lactarius, right? <laughs> um, so here's, here's uh, Russula compactor, the firm Russula. There are hundreds of different Russulas, and they're brightly colored, and you think, oh, well, I can find out what this, what this is, bright red, you know, and you go to the books, there are about 10 bright red Russulas. So this one is, is rather recognizable. It has a, um, uh, a kind of flesh-colored cap. Um, and it's got a very firm texture, almost hard. Um, it's still, it's still, it's still um, brittle, but, but solid. Um, and it has a slightly unpleasant odor. Not, it, I, I, I've never eaten it. It's not recommended. I don't think it tastes very good. Um, here's one that is recommended for eating. This is the, gr the green quilt russula. Um, a, a more fragile uh, russula, and it, it's green. I you think it's, oh, green, that's a poisonous color. No, no, this is a good edible. And, and look at how it breaks up into these, these patches. Uh, you can see why it's called the quilt russula. And there's one very similar that's brownish and that's equally edible. Um, so that is a good summer edible if you can get there before the, whoops, if you can get there before the bugs. Uh, it, it does tend to get eaten by little bugs from the, from the, they come up the stem. So you cut off the stem and it's got lots and lots and lots, lots of little holes in it. No good. 
Um, okay, another family, and you'll notice we're, we're going through the guild mushrooms first. These are all cap and stem and guild mushrooms. Another uh, family uh, that we commonly find are the lepiotas. Look at that beauty. Tall, and, and that's why the notable of the family, they tend to be rather slender. Um, they have these lovely, uh, slightly scaly caps, um, often a little knob or umbo at the top. There are a lot of small, you know, this size or even this size, lepiotas in the woods, leave them severely alone. They are mostly poisonous. But this one is good. This is called Macrolepiota prosera, or the parasol uh, mushroom. And it grows in woods or at the edges of woods. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's got a dead ringer, <laughs> which is poisonous. Uh, these are really hard to tell in the field, except for one characteristic. Um, this is called the green spider. This is called Chlorophyllum molybdates, the green spored parasol. When it is mature, and maybe that one is big enough to be mature, if you turn the cap over, the gills start to st are staining a kind of dirty green color uh, because the spores, the ripening spores, are green. Um, if it's young, oh, wait a minute. If it's young, like that one, you're going to have to be really good to tell the difference between a young Chlorophyllum molybdates and a young parasol. And I've, I've been mistaken, although I haven't poisoned myself. Because I, I only eat these if they're mature. Once they've opened up completely wide, if they're still white, OK, you've got, you've got Macrolepiota prosera. Notice also how the, the stem is somewhat brownish and the stem of this is whitish. Um, they also have, and none of these show them, they have a ring around the upper part of the stem. It's more like a collar, um, which eventually becomes detached and can move up and down. So when they were very young, you can see the, the stem, the, uh, the cap is joined, up, joined onto the stem. And then when it opens up, it leaves it leaves a ring around the stem. A number of mushrooms do that. Um, so really nice if you can tell the difference. Uh, this is strictly a pasture mush mushroom. And you will probably find quite a lot of that around here, particularly rich pasture, maybe that's had some animals in it. Beautiful. Sometimes it just grows on lawns. Beautiful mushroom. Um, some more grassland mushrooms that you might find. Um, and these are good edibles. Uh, here's a very recognizable one, uh, the shaggy mane or lawyer's wig that comes up often on roadsides, tall, that could be eight, nine inches. And it's got this, where's my, hello. I think I'm losing my, it's not a very, it's not a very, I think I'm losing my pointer. Um, it's, um, um, it, well, that's what it looks like. And then it, op it starts to open up, becomes bell-shaped. Um, and the gills turn black at the edges because it's actually got black spores. Uh, you want it while it's still young and before the spores ripen. Um, but a lovely one if you can find it. I get, and, and also, and more common, the Agaricus campestris, the, the meadow mushroom, um, with um, gills that are pink when it's young, and chocolate brown when it's older because the spores are deep chocolate brown, so they're coloring the gills even when the mushroom's very young. This is, the, this is very closely related to the button mushroom that you buy in stores. Um, it is edible, but be careful. Um, Agaricus is a large and complex family, and some of, them are, some of them are poisonous. The poisonous ones smell funny and generally have a tendency to stain yellow somewhere on the, at the very base of the stem. So um, actually, although, you know, though this is the one that in Europe has been picked for centuries. It's the only one that people know in Europe, in, in England, I would say. Um, it's, it's a bit dodgy because, as I say, Agaricus is a big and complicated family. 
And you're more likely to find all of these in spring and fall than in the middle of the summer. It's a tough world out there in the sunshine for mushrooms. The pasture mushrooms um, often prefer the fruit in the, in, the, in the spring and fall when you know, temperatures are a little more reasonable and the ground isn't baked hard. I call these the purple trio because they're just beautiful. Um, here's, this is, here's Cortinarius iodes, the spotted court. Cortinarius is a big family. Uh, they all have um, rusty brown spores, and you can see how these gills that started off sort of purple colored become rusty brown as the spores ripen. They also have Cortina means veil, and they also have a, a veil that connects the edge of the cap to the stem when they're very young. Um, but it's tenuous, it's like cobwebs. I think you can possibly see a little bit of it on the stem there. Um, Cortinarius, another family like the uh, Amanitas that we do not touch. There's some very, very poisonous members in that family um, that can send you to hospital with kidney failure. Um, so enjoy Cortinarius iodes. Notice the lovely lilac cap. And these little white random splashes, they're, they look as if, you know, maybe there just was a tear in the cap or something, but actually, no, every single one has them randomly distributed. So spotted court is what we call that. Um, this one, however, is good to eat. Rather similar coloring. Got to be careful with this. It's called the bluet. Um, it comes up in the fall, after most mushrooms. I would look for this in October, November, December even. Down here, yes, right into the winter. It likes mulch piles and the edges of woods. Um, and it has, these very, it has a short stem, very close gills, lovely lilac color. Not an easy one to learn to recognize, but edible and very good. And finally, here's a common, slightly earlier fall mushroom. September, I look for this one, called Lacaria ochropurpurea. Gosh, isn't it similar? Um, but notice how much for further space the gills are. The stem is longer. It's also a very fibrous stem. Uh, You'll notice that texture is something that photographs cannot reproduce. Um, uh, it's a longer, more fibrous stem. Uh, Lacaria ochropurpurea, the purple gilled Lacaria. That one also edible. Um, and sometimes comes up in large numbers in the fall in woodland. All of these are woodland species. Um, OK, mushrooms do not have to grow on the ground. A lot of them grow on wood. They are actually wonderful digesters of the lignins and cellulose that make up the woody part of wood. So without mushrooms, uh, you know, we'd be up to here in uh, undecayed trees, dead trees. Um, mushrooms are doing the heavy lifting when it comes to decaying wood. Um, and here is one of the commonest, the honey fungus, um, on the left there, um, comes up in big clusters at the base of trees. This is actually a parasite. It kills living trees and then continues as a sap probe, helping the early decomposition of the tree it's just killed. Um, foresters do not like the honey fungus, but it's a good edible. It's a, it's a substantial, chunky mushroom with um, a very fibrous stem. You probably don't want to eat the stems. Um, and it has white spores. And usually you can see that the spores are white because what they do, because they grow so, so clustered that the upper caps leave a white spore deposit on the uh, lower ones. I'm not sure you can really see that here because they're all rather young in this, in this photograph. Um, but you can see that they're growing at the, at the base of a tree there. Um, or sometimes out along the, um, along 
the, um, apparently in the grass, but they're really on buried roots. Um, so with caution, uh, that is a good edible. And the caution is that there's a not similar, somewhat smaller brown spored autumn fruiting mushroom called Gallerina autumnalis, which is a really nasty poisonous mushroom. Um, and here is the Pleurotus ostriatus, the summer oyster. Um, sad tendency to be infested with little beetles. Um, but a nice edible if you can find it. Grows sometimes in large quantities on dead wood. Usually wood that's still got a bit of bark on it. That one hasn't. Uh, on logs, stumps, snags, you know, still standing dead trees. Um, and that one, rather, uh, rather easy to, to tell. It's fairly, fairly big, sort of, you know, like this. Um, and it has gills that go all the way down the stem, all the way down the stem to the point of attachment, known as pleurotoid gills, because uh, it's a pleurotus. Um, and so if you, if you see that fairly well, fairly well separated gills that run all the way down the stem to the base. There is a stem, but it's got the gills all the way down it. Good edible. More edible gill <laughs> mushrooms on wood. Woo, here's a weird one, the Entoloma abortivum. Uh, entolomas are a, a group of mushrooms that we don't normally eat, again, because there's some poisonous ones among them. Um, but the aborted entoloma lives in coordination with the honey fungus, and it's not quite determined wh which one is parasitic on the other one. Um, but the curious thing is that you get these aborted forms growing. These are just little sort of round things. They don't have gills. They don't really have much shape. When you cut them open, they're a bit kind of streaky white and pink inside. And the whole mushroom is delicious. So if you find the aborted form and some caps as well, you can be pretty certain what you've got. Um, Although this one, I do say, uh, this is a mushroom I don't show my family until I've cooked it. <laughs> it's a bit yucky. <laughs> here's a quite different, whoops, whoopsie, come back. Uh, here's a quite different on the right, Zeriola furfuracea. I think they've given it a new name now, Hemiaporus. No, that's not right. Anyway, uh, no, Hy Hymen... I can't remember the new genus name. Anyway, you'll find it in books like um, uh, um, the uh, Audubon Guide of Zerula. Uh, the rooting mushroom, uh, pretty mushroom. It, 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 it's very tall and slender, and it's got this sort of um, yellowish-brown cap, which typically has a lot of radial wrinkles on it. Um, and then the stem goes down. The stem is quite um, is long. It's not brittle. You can, if you break it, it'll, it'll, it won't break. It'll just fold over. You know, it's, it's, it's got a certain fibrous quality to it. And at the base, the stem just goes on going, going down and becomes like a rather hard little root going way down. It's tapping into buried wood. Um, and that, that root, you know, the whole f mushroom can be about this high and then much again of that root-like structure. It is not a root, but it is a root-like structure. Um, and that's pretty, uh, you know, you find that, that, you yank it up and bits of this root come with it, you, you definitely got a, um, a rooting mushroom. Uh, it's edible, but frankly, it's nothing to write home about. Um, but, um, you know, there are mushrooms where you, you know, you, you saute them up in butter and you think they're going to be delicious, and what you get tastes like Cooked butter. <laughs> That's one of them. Um, here's a couple you don't want to eat that grow on wood. Um, very common on wood, Paxillus atrotomentosus, the velvet-footed pax. Um, definite uh, key feature is this stem that is sort of brown, woolly velvet. Nothing else quite like it. And a very distinct change where the, where the gills start 
and the gills, the gills are decurrent, they run down the stem a certain distance, and then boom, the stem changes and it becomes this woolly, this woolly foot. It grows on very old, dead um, stumps, mostly. Um, you know, that are mostly just rotted, almost rotted completely away. You can see this, this, this is a stump, it's covered with mosses, but these uh, velvet-footed packs are doing the last bit of, um, uh, the last bit of decomposition. Quite common, and when you do find it, you'll typically find quite a lot of it, you know, more or less covering the stump. And, uh, and then there's the jack-o'-lantern, oh wow. When you see this one, I mean it lights up the whole forest. Uh, I've seen, uh, it grows around at the base of and near dead trees. And I've seen them growing, you know, if there was a stump where you are, I've seen them growing up to 10 feet away in a, you know, in a sort of, not a circle, but just a, you know, bunches of clusters of them all over under a tree, uh, quite unmistakable. Um, big clusters of big orange mushrooms, again with gills that run down the stem, um, and that is the jack-o'-lantern. Definitely don't want to eat that one. I mean, that one's going to give you a really bad, it's not going to kill you, it'll give you a really bad stomach ache. Um, and unfortunately, people mistake it for chanterelle. Um, it's much bigger, it's more clustered, it grows on wood, none, it has real gills, none of those are chanterelle features, but people want it to be a chanterelle, so they kind of <laughs> ignore all the signs that are saying, but I'm not a chanterelle, I'm a jack-o'-lantern. Yeah. Um, the nice, fun, fun thing about this one, if you take, uh, I can't remember whether it's young caps or old caps, but you take some into a dark closet and sit with it for about 20 minutes, you will actually see it glow in the dark. It's, it's bioluminescent. Or on a very dark night, you can just walk outside and, and see it. I've, I've seen it. Um, there's, a <laughs> there's, a, there's a mushroom writer who claims, who claims never to have seen it. He says it's a, it's, a, it's a myth. He says, you know, he sat in dark closets with it. He says, I can think of, I can think of a lot better things to do in a dark closet for 20 minutes than, 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 than um, looking for bioluminescence on jack-o'-lantern. I mean, he's having a joke. It, it really is bioluminescent. Um, some more mushrooms growing on wood, uh, it goes with gills. Uh, Pluteus savinus, the fawn mushroom, I mean, they say it's edible, but frankly, it's a um, rather undistinguished mushroom, um, but it has, it has pinkish gills because the spores are pinkish. Um, rather similar, but with white gills, Megacolibia platyphylla, comes out quite early in the, in, in the year. You find that one from April, May onwards. Um, that's um, also edible, but kind of worthless. Um, also called broad gill, because the gills are very deep from top to bottom. You know, they're, 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 if, you think of, if you think of the gill vertically, some of them are shallow, they don't come far down from the cap. Some of them are broad. This one, these are very broad. And then Trichylomopsis rutilans, plum, plums and custard, can you see why? Isn't it pretty? Uh, grows on decayed wood. Um, I think that one really is inedible. I think that one might give you some indigestion. But it's gorgeous. Right, done with the gilled mushrooms. Enough of them, that's about half. And about half of what you see normally is, is gilled mushrooms. They're the commonest. Those gills, I mean, there's a reason for this. Those gills give you a wonderful surface area for developing spores. It is, it is a, a, a good uh, way of distributing spores. So many families of mushrooms have developed gills as their form of spore dispersal. They're not necessarily all closely related. When they do the DNA of these things, they discover that gills have probably been invented by mushrooms about six different times. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a stratagem that many different families of mushrooms have developed to distribute their, gill, their, their spores. The Chanterelle family did not get quite as far as developing gills. Uh, it developed 
folds or wrinkles instead. What you've got here is not real plate-like gills, but thicker folds. So what you really got there is a flat, uh, um, a, really a, a flat undersurface to the cap, which is the fertile surface. And it's just kind of wrinkled up to get a bit more surface area. You were tempted to say it's sort of intermediate, it's maybe developing gills, or maybe it had gills and it's undeveloping them, who knows. Um, but this is a lovely edible. There are many different chanterelles in our area, they are all edible. Uh, this is one of the best. Um, this is the golden chanterelle. Uh, the books call it Cantharella sibarius, but that's the European species, which is now found to be different from the American species. So I'm not quite sure what the American species is going to end up being called. Um, but there it is. Um, it does not grow in big clusters, maybe a small two or three in a cluster. It grows on the ground, not on wood. Um, it does not have real gills. Hopefully, there are some out there. I, it, it, th this is a really, really common summer mushroom if it's rained enough. It, it likes a lot of rain to fruit. And if you hit a dry spell, it will just sort of sit there not fruiting uh, and then will fruit again when you get enough rain. So some, some summers, in a dry summer, you might find very few chanterelles. In a wet summer, boy, it's the commonest mushroom in the woods. Um, and there's lots and lots of it in the foothills around here. Um, so that's the golden chanterelle. Um, and then we've got the, uh, the little cinnabar chanterelle, which is a, uh, a, it's not quite as orangey. You know how colors in, in photographs are not quite true? It's, it's redder than that. Um, pretty little thing. Um, and um, it's edible too, although I always think it adds more color than taste to a dish. And you've got to collect a lot of them to make it worthwhile. Um, Oh, here's, here's an ugly little mushroom, which is so good, the black trumpet. Really, re really common, really, really hard to see because they look like little black holes or curled up blackened oak, old oak leaves. Um, but, and they're not big, but they are well worth collecting. Soft texture, you really can't, just, you really, if you look for the little black holes, and, and, and a, like, like, very thin, but, and, and um, definitely not, not soft like yucky, but, but you know, tender. <laughs> Lovely mushroom, gorgeous. I always look out for those. But you can walk past them nine times out of 10 and just not see they're there. Um, and our next group is going to be the boletes. The boletes are mushrooms that have not gills but spores. That is, instead of the spores developing on the outside of gills, they develop on the inside of tubes that hang down from the cap with, a pore, with an opening at the bottom, a pore. So when you look at them, from, you turn it upside down, you're seeing something that looks like a sort of sponge, you know, with little holes in it. Um, so well, you know, it, looks like a, it looks like a gilled mushroom, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's actually a bolete. It's a gilled bolete, you see? Nothing, there's no absolutes in, in mushrooms, there are always exceptions. Um, there are things about its, even its gross morphology that told uh, you know, the early taxonomists that this did not properly belong in, in gilled mushrooms. And I don't know whether you can see, but the gills are kind of forked and cross-veined. Well, if you cross-vein between two gills, you've got an elongated paw, haven't you? Um, and then there's other things about it that actually classify it in, in, in the bolete. And it, it's got a nice reddish-brown top and bright bright yellow gills, so it's pretty unmistakable. Um, and, and the gills run down the stem a bit. The gilled bolete, um, it's quite common, but you usually only find one of it. It, 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 isn't, it doesn't grow gregariously like many other mushrooms, so I seldom gather enough of, of it to be worth eating. 
Um, but there it is, rejoicing in the name of Philoporus Rhodoxanthus. Say that three times quickly. Real Boletes. Ah. Here's Boletus bicolor. Um, there are actually a rather a lot of Boletes that have a reddish, pinkish red cap, a red stem with a bit of yellow in it and yellow, por yellow pores. Um, so um, I actually don't recommend the, the Boletus bicolor as an edible for beginners. It's too hard to distinguish it. Um, here's one that you will find a lot of. This likes about this elevation. We don't find it so much in the mountains. This is called Austroboletus betula, or according to the newer books, Hemiaporus betula. The shaggy stalked bolete. Can you think why? Um, I mean, look at that stalk. Um, a lot of boletes have what are called reticulations, that is a sort of raised network on the stem. This takes it to an extreme. Um, and it almost forgot about developing a cap after all that. It's a ridiculous little cap. Um, uh, and it's, it's a bit, um, the cap's a bit slimy, and most people would rather remove the skin from the cap before eating it. Um, or alternatively, throw the cap away and just eat the stem. <laughs> I have a friend who cooks it like asparagus and says it's delicious. Um, so you will find this one is very easy to distinguish. Uh, uh, the shaggy stalk bolete, and it's a good edible. And you'll find this in the summer and fall. It's probably coming out around about now. More boletes. These are both edible. Um, and they both grow under pines, only under pines. Uh, Sulus granulatus under pretty much any sort of pine, Sulus pictus, only under white pine. What are your pines here? I see them out the window. Which sort of pines do you have mostly? Anybody know? Loblolly. Loblolly. Well, I don't think you're going to find pictus under loblolly, but you might find granulatus. Um, and um, so these are both boletes. They've both got poor surfaces. Um, unlike some other boletes, they're in the different genus. And one of the things that marks this is, is the pores are kind of irregular. They're not like little round pores. Um, they're, uh, they're more kind of cross-connected things. Um, this one, interestingly, in fact, I think, yeah, this one has a, has a, a had a, or when it was young, had a um, partial veil. The edge of the cap was connected to the stem, leaves a ring. And it's got this lovely sort of dry red scaly. Not many scaly boletes around. That's one of them. Very unmistakable. If you're under a white pine and you find this scaly red thing growing on the ground with, with um, pores, with these irregular pores underneath, you've got Suellus pictus. Um, and uh, the young ones are very good. The older ones tend to go moldy rather fast. But um, uh, I, I usually just pick the young ones. They dry. They dry very nicely. Uh, Sulus granulatus is another of those ones with a sticky top that you really feel like you should peel them. Um, I don't think they're quite as good as Sulus pictus. Um, but, they're both, but they're both good edibles. Uh, dotted stalk, and I haven't really got a good picture of the stalk. I don't know if you can see on there, but there are little kind of dots on the stalk. And when you look closely at the top of the stalk, and if you look under the cap, you'll find these little reddish, reddish dots. And here's our last two boletes, another scaly one, Strobolomyces floccopus, my all-time favorite mushroom name, old man of the woods. Uh, pretty common, uh, not a pretty looking thing, um, but rather dramatic when you come across it. Um, and that is actually edible. Turns black in the saucepan, in the, in the frying pan, but don't worry, it's edible. Um, this one you would not, oops, oops, I keep getting them wrong. Get back. Uh, this guy on the right, uh, the violet bitter bolete. You don't want to eat it because it's really, really bitter. Unless you're one of those lucky people who doesn't taste bitter. Some people really are not affected by bitter, in which case it's edible. Um, but it's beautiful. It's got this wonderful lilac coloration. And it's very chunky. It's got a swollen stalk. Uh, just a lovely, just a lovely mushroom. Um, now, polypores also have tubes. How am I doing for time? 
I think we're getting, we're getting near the end. Polypores have tubes uh, and, and, and pores. They develop them quite independently of boletes. They're not at all connected with boletes. Um, they grow mostly on wood. They're mostly tough and leathery or even woody. Um, and they most, what's the other thing that they have? Um, three, three things you look for. Um, they grow on wood, they have pores, and they're tough and leathery. Any two of those will do for a polypore. <laughs> so there are polypores that grow on the ground, there are polypores that are actually um, quite soft, uh, and there are polypores, believe it or not, that have gills. They're still polypores. But your typical polypore, here's your typical polypore. Um, this guy down here is called uh, Trichaptum biformi. You will find it everywhere on living trees, dead trees, stumps, logs. Um, when it's young, it has this, this lovely sort of lilac edge to it. Um, it's called um, Trichaptum biformi. It's called the violet toothed polypore. Um, and it's extremely common, and it, 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 it overwinters as a sort of dryish thing, so you find it always. Um, this one, hemlock varnish shelf, Ganoderma tsuge, also known as rishi, it's a, it's a well-known medicinal mushroom. Um, unfortunately, all too common, because it grows on dead hemlocks, and we have a lot of dead hemlocks around now. Um, this is... Trimetes versicolor, the turkey tail. Uh, lovely. That's got white underneath. Uh, another medicinal. Um, I don't know that there's any use for trichaptum by forming the violet tooth polypore. Um, so there's three polypores. Um, the violet tooth tail have somewhat similar growth, growth habits. You know, you can see them forming layers. The hemlock varnish shelf. Um, more single stems. Uh, it has this whoops, come on. It has this wonderful kind of varnished, shiny. And when it gets older, the, the whole top of the of the cap is is is, is, is shiny, chestnut coloured varnish. So there are three very common inedible um, polypores, which are more or less woody. There are some edible polypores too. Ooh. This is, this is uh, Fistulina hepatica, the beefsteak polypore. And when you cut into it, it is marbled. It looks like raw meat, it really does. It's got a somewhat, it's very unmistakable. There's nothing else quite like it with this reddish coloration on top, very fine, uh, very tightly packed pores, and this marbled color, marbled flesh. Um, it's got a sort of oddly um, sharp lemony flavor. Uh, some people like it. I, I don't care for it, but you know, everybody's different. Ah, uh, ah, chicken of the woods. Gorgeous, orangey on top, bright yellow pores underneath. A real find, if you can find it young enough, it is delicious. Ah, and even better, the holy grail, hen of the woods. Quite distinct, chicken of the woods because it tastes like chicken, hen of the woods because it looks like a hen all fluffed up and getting angry. Um, and it has lots and lots of, that's not a great photograph, it has lots and lots of um, separate lobes all sort of fused together. And it grows at the foot. Uh, Chicken of the Wood grows on a number of different hardwoods, but always a dead tree. Um, a often a log that's already lost all its bark. Hen of the Wood grows at the base of living or dead oak trees um, and comes out. Uh, chicken of the Woods is spring through summer and into the f early fall. Hen of the Woods is a late fall fungus, comes out in September to October um, and is a delicious edible. And you know, you find one, it could weigh 10 pounds. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a big, big find. But you know what? You can spend an awful long time Walking around, oak, walking around oak trees. There's a lot of oaks out there. You just happen on them. And then go back next year.
because it will grow again in the same place. And some mushrooms have teeth. Uh, we've had gills, we've had pores, and here are teeth, which is a bit like a pore inside, a, a tube inside out. The, the spores are developing on the, on the outside of those spines. And this is a common one, a nice uh, sort of apricot yellow color, hiddenum repandum, the hedgehog, the hedgehog mushroom. If you see that orange color uh, with the teeth hanging down, you view that's pretty much what you've got. Um, Right, now we get into some different shapes altogether. Uh, coral, cauliflower mushrooms, uh, they grow at the foot of pine trees or on pine tree stumps. Again, a big mushroom, uh, very delicious. Uh, wood ear or tree ear grows a bit more like a polypore, but there's no pores on it. It's just a sort of got a, and it's got a kind of interestingly jelly texture. Uh, the Chinese use it a lot. Um, in, uh, if you've eaten sweet and sour soup, there's, there's chopped up wood ears in that, or should be. Um, so those are two good edibles that are pretty hard to mistake. Puffballs, these are actually not related at all to each other, but they all have this, uh, they have all separately evolved this uh, um, way of distributing the spores, which is to keep everything inside a, 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 um, a membrane until the spores ripen and then it dries up and the spores puff, puff out through a break in the, in the membrane. Uh, oh, what a fun thing this one is, the Calistoma cinnaburina, the puffball in aspic, also called hot lips. That's, that, that, will be the, that up there will be the hole where the uh, spores eventually puff out. Extraordinary little mushroom. Um, the earth ball with this uh, thick, Pigskin like, it's also called the pigskin, poison pigskin puffball, um, and, a, and a blackish spore uh, mass. And then numerous uh, lycopurdens, which are small, white, and when they're young, completely white inside. Um, and they're edible, you, but you want to you wanna make sure that you haven't got a very young earth ball. Um, they're always, they've got sort of marshmallow texture inside, pure white when they're young. They're, they're, they're edible, not great, but edible. Somebody talked to me about lobster mushrooms. Um, well, we've got really not one but two mushrooms here uh, on the left. Um, there's a host mushroom which has got completely colonized by a mold. Uh, who wants to be a moldy mushroom? Well, in this case, me for one, because this mold has a curious uh, capacity of preserving the flesh of the uh, host mushroom and making it edible. The host mushroom is a russula, usually a russula called russula brevipes, which is not edible, it's not poisonous, it's just nasty. But when it gets covered in the hypomyces lactiflorum, the mold, it becomes delicious and firm and quite long-lasting. Um, they're very misshapen, yeah. Can that lobster grow on Well, mm, I, think it, I think I've seen it on, on Lactarius deceptivus, which is another, remember Lactarius and Russulas are related. Um, it's never been known to colonize anything else. So these molds are pretty specific. So you get other molds on other mushrooms that are very specific to a genus or even a species. So no, I don't think anybody has ever been poisoned with a poisonous host for the lobster mushroom. Um, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's very firm, it's deep orange, and you see it sort of pushing up the duff, usually, usually with a sunken uh, center. Um, here's, here's Lactarius deceptivus, which I think is a host around here, although many people say, no, it's, it's not. The Russula brevipes is the host. But anyway, um, that's, whoops, that's just a, a regular milk mushroom, which is, has acrid milk. Uh, but if it has the mold on it, it is rendered edible. Little joke. And the best for last, morels. Anybody here collected morels? 
Yeah. Yeah, they're hard to see, aren't they? Very, they're hard to find, and even when they are around, they're hard to see. Um, around here, in South Carolina, I would go to uh, hardwood bottomlands near a creek um, where, there's, uh, where, flo where flooding every so often has left a lot of silty soil. Um, and look under poplars, green ash, white ash, um, and they should be there at the end of March. Um, and they'll be the yellow morels. Up in the mountains, we get more of the black morels, and they grow in poplar coves. Is it true that morels grow uh, by beech trees? That they're attracted to growing by a beech tree? I haven't heard that one, but you know, there's lots of different morels all over the country, and everybody has their own sort of favorite association. I mean, um, in the north, they'll look under dead elms, dead trees, definitely dead hickories for sure. They seem to like dead trees. I don't know why. And then out west, you get the burn morels, where there's been pine forests that have burned and wildflowers, and they go out, the mushroom hunters go out the next spring, you know, after the July, August wildflowers, they go out the next April, May after the snow has gone and they pick hundreds and hundreds of pounds of burn morels. So we don't seem to, either we don't get that variety here or our fires are not hot enough and there's not that many fires around here, thank, thank goodness. So we don't really get the burn morels. But we do get morels coming up in habitats year after year. Um, and um, all the true morels are good. Uh, the true morels have this pitted um, uh, cap, and um, the cap joins the stem and is hollow inside. And remember that because of some other spring mushrooms that look at superficially a little bit alike, but they're more kind of where this is concave with pits, they're more convex, sort of brain-like. Um, so true morels, absolutely delicious. So um, if you've enjoyed this, um, by all means, $5 will buy you the CD to keep.